Let me invite you to open your Bibles to the seventh chapter of Mark's Gospel. All summer long, we've been dealing with the, uh, the nature and the character of God. We've talked about God's holiness and His righteousness and His um, faithfulness, His fidelity, His majesty and His mercy and His love. And today we're going to talk about God or Jesus, the teacher. They called Him rabbi. They called Him teacher. There will be 16,000 plus students this Wednesday in Abilene Independent School District that will go back into the classroom and uh, hundreds more, thousands more at Wiley uh, next week. There will be college students that make their way back to the campus. In fact, we have some here this morning. On the third row in the last service, we had five college young men who I think are part of Danny's home team each week. We've missed them all summer long. They're, they're, that, that third pew has been weeping all summer long. And all five of those guys were here this morning. It was so good to, uh, to see them back. Someone said that uh, a mediocre teacher tells and uh, an average teacher explains, a good teacher demonstrates, but a great teacher inspires. Jesus was a great teacher. Have you found Mark chapter 7? Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. There were basically three groups that Jesus taught throughout His ministry. And all three are found in this chapter, uh, Mark chapter 7. We'll not read the first four verses, but let's begin at verse 5. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Him, that is, they asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Uh, The Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees made up the religious leaders of Jesus' day, and they had their minds fixed against Jesus. Here they are criticizing the disciples of Jesus, which means they're really criticizing Jesus. And it's all about the way that the disciples weren't washing their hands properly. It had nothing to do with hygiene. It had everything to do with ceremonial cleansing. Uh, in their uh, tradition of, of, of the Jews of that day, you always washed your hands a certain way if you wanted to be morally correct. And, and uh, it's kind of like the way a, a surgeon washes his hands before surgery. You had your hands up, you poured water over them so that they ran down your elbow, and you took a fist and you would grind your fist into this hand until it was clean, and then grind your fist into that hand. But these Pharisees who tried to keep all the law, they noticed the disciples of Jesus didn't do it that way. And they said, why are they neglecting our great traditions? Jesus answered in verse 6, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but from their, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. In other words, you've taken your traditions and you've elevated them above the Word of God. And the commandments of God. You've given more authority to your tradition than you have to the Holy Scripture. Verse 10. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, anything of mine that you might have been helped by is korban, that is said to be given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Jesus said, the Word of God says you're to honor your parents. And if your parents are elderly and they are in need of financial assistance and you have money to help them, you ought to help them. But your traditions say, oh no, this money over here that could be used for my parents, we've declared that as korban or dedicated to God. So we can't use that to help our parents. They'll just have to make it some other way. Jesus said, you've done that with so many things. You've placed the tradition of men above the Scriptures. Verse 13, thus invalidating the the Word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. And summoning the multitude again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And when leaving the multitude, 
he had entered the house, his disciples questioned him about this parable. And he said to them, are you too so uncomprehending? Do you not see that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and it is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods unclean. By the way, that's one of the favorite verses among Baptists. All foods are, un- are clean. Uh, we can eat anything we want. That's basically what he was saying there. Verse 20, and he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts and fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. And may his Holy Spirit apply the preaching and the teaching of his word to your heart and to my heart this day. Please be seated. A few years ago, in a a startling triumph of machine over man, IBM's supercomputer, nicknamed Deep Blue, won the World's Chess Championship. By taking on the world champion Gary Kasparov and defeating him, Deep Blue struck a blow for the efficiency of machine over man. Now, I know it was just a chess match, but it has deep implications. And some of them are unsettling implications. Take our teachers, for instance. I mentioned that there will be 16,000 students going to school. 2,500 teachers in AISD will be going back into the classroom. And in our local schools, in our local universities, I don't think tenure is offered on many of our campuses, if any of our campuses. So what if a teacher had a particularly bad year in the classroom? Could they be replaced by a machine? Could they be replaced by a supercomputer like Deep Blue, which I guess would be appropriate at Cooper, or Deep Gold at Abilene High, or Deep Purple at Wiley? Yeah, I've thought about that some this week. My wife, Claudia, is a school teacher. And this week, she, along with those 2,500 school teachers in AISD, will go back into the classroom to greet those 16,000 students who we hope are eager to learn and eager to take that next step in their educational journey. Could a supercomputer do a better job teaching 7th grade Texas history at Craig Middle School than a Claudia Alcorn could do? I remember an assignment that was given to us in the 4th grade by my 4th grade teacher, Miss Mary Jane Bowden. It was at South Elementary in, uh, in Brownwood, Texas. It was the year after my dad had passed away. And Miss Bowden said, okay, today, uh, take out your drawing paper, and we're going to draw a picture of our immediate family. So I began to draw. I drew a picture of my dog, Sparky, and a picture of my sister, Hopi, and a picture of my mother. And then it was just one of those grief moments where it dawned on me, Dad is not in the picture, and he will never be in this picture again. And I began to tear up at my desk. And Miss Bowden saw that, and she knew me, and she knew our story. And she said, Stan, I I have an errand for you to run. Would you meet me outside the class? And I went as quickly as I could out into the hallway where I began to cry. And before I knew what was happening, and and this probably shouldn't say it about a lady like Miss Bowden, but, but I felt like this big bear had just grabbed me and hugged me to herself. And I I just, I was able to weep. And she cried with me. And I don't think a supercomputer could ever do what Miss Bowden did for that fourth grade boy in 1963. A supercomputer could probably make high school biology interesting, but not fun, like Mr. Stone did for us at John Kennedy High School in Anaheim. So much so that I... I gave up going to an NBA Finals game between the Lakers and the Milwaukee Bucks 
My stepdad had been given a ticket for that Sunday night game. He was going to let me miss church on Sunday night to go to the NBA Finals. He never let me miss church. The only time we ever missed church on Sunday night was in July of 1969 to watch, the guy, to watch Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. I mean, that, it had to be that important to miss church. He was going to let me go to an NBA Finals. But I had a test in Mr. Stone's class the next day. Biology. And I didn't want to let him down. And I said, nope. After church tonight, I need to study for that test. Now, I would have never missed that game for a computer or a machine, even a supercomputer. But I did for that high school biology teacher who made science fun. And it was a real live college history professor named Ralph Lynn who taught me and a room full of freshmen in the fall of 1972 how to read a book, almost any book, in 20 minutes' time. And walk away with a pretty good understanding of what that author's point was, what he was trying to communicate. I don't think a supercomputer could have ever matched the simplicity of that one 15-minute lesson that was taught to us by Dr. Ralph Lynn. And if I asked you to this morning, you could probably go back in your mind. And some of you might have to go back 50, 60, even 70 years. But you could think of a teacher that had such an impact on your life, that you are the person you are today to a large extent because of their influence. By the principles they impart, by the patterns they set, teachers shape our world. They shape our society, and they shape our lives. Part of the explanation for the permanent impact that Jesus has had on humanity was his extraordinary ability to teach. Of course, he was more than a teacher. He was and is the Son of God. He's our Savior. He is the Messiah. He's the exalted Lord. He not only taught the good news, Jesus died and rose again so that there would be good news to teach. But he was more than a teacher. More than a teacher. And yet, the truth remains, part of the explanation for the permanent impact on our world and on history was his extraordinary ability to teach. Remember, before he was called Lord, he was called Rabbi. He was called Teacher. Jesus taught in part by his actions. He taught by what he did. In his baptism, Jesus taught us that repentance is an important element in our relationship with God. In his temptation experience, he taught us that the Word of God is so important for combating Satan's temptations in our lives. In choosing the twelve disciples, he taught us that God can use the ordinary person to do extraordinary things in the kingdom work. In his concern for the social and religious outcasts of his day, Jesus taught us that God loves the least and God loves the last. In his response to the scribes and Pharisees, he taught us that God detests religious pomposity and religious pretense. In his treatment of women and children, he taught us that neither are to be abused or neglected. In his miracles, Jesus reminded us that God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. In his death on the cross, Jesus was teaching us that there is no limit whatsoever to the eternal love of God for you and for me. And by his resurrection, Jesus taught us that death is not the end of the road. It's merely a bend in the road. If Jesus had never spoken a word, he would have gone down in history as one of the greatest teachers who ever lived because of all the things he was able to teach by what he did. But speak, Jesus did do. And my, his words were incredible. He spoke words of truth and encouragement. Words of life and words of hope. Challenging words and inspiring words and strong words and divine words. In the dual dynamic of what he did and what he said, Jesus taught his extraordinary truths from God. This morning I want us to explore two aspects of the teaching ministry of Jesus. Jesus' methods of teaching and Jesus' substance of teaching. How did he teach in such a way that we were so impacted by it and was so effective? And what did Jesus teach that was so important we remember it still to this day? Let's take his method first. What was the method of Jesus teaching? Well, if you read the Gospels, and especially this seventh chapter of Mark, you'll understand that Jesus chose his method of teaching according to the audience that he was addressing. In our text this morning, Jesus spoke to three different groups. He spoke to the religious leaders and used a particular method with them. He spoke to that 
anonymous crowd that was always following him, and he had a distinctive method for them. And then he spoke to his disciples and had, and yet, had yet a third method of teaching for them. Let's look at each one of those. In Mark chapter 7, our text this morning, those first 13 verses, it was the religious leaders that were the audience of Jesus. Their minds were already fixed in opposition to Jesus. And when Jesus was dealing with those kind of folks, his method of teaching was confrontation. He confronted their hypocrisy. He confronted their lack of compassion. Jesus confronted those, those religious leaders for their false piety. And that was his method when dealing with people whose minds were fixed and, and were, were uh, contentious. He met them with confrontation. But then in verses 14 through 16, Jesus is talking to the crowd. It's that anonymous crowd that, that, that's always following Jesus. That's his audience. And with them, he used a method we might call imagination. He tells them a story that communicates the same truth he's trying to get across to those religious leaders. But he does so by using a parable, a short, cryptic parable. In verse 15, he says, nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. That parable has the same message that his confrontation had. Only here, he's using imagination. Because below the surface, Jesus could see the potential of faith that could come out if it was just properly stimulated. And so Jesus attempts to draw out that faith by stimulating the imagination of the crowd. With those whose minds were in flux, Jesus used imagination. With those whose minds were fixed against him, he used confrontation. And with the third group, the disciples, he used explanation. Their minds were sharpened by faith. They were not in flux like the crowd. They were not opposed to Christ or fixed like the religious leaders. But they wanted to learn. They wanted to grow. And so Jesus took them aside and he began to explain the parable to them point by point and then made application to their lives. So for those whose minds were fixed, he gave a challenge, confrontation. For those who were neither here nor there, he gave a hint. He, he, he challenged their imagination. And then for those who were already eager to learn and had faith in Christ, he used explanation. Those were his three different methods of teaching, and he chose those methods dependent upon which group he was addressing. But what was the substance of Jesus' teaching? We know how he taught, but but what was the, the theme or the essence of the lessons that he gave? Well, a close look at the Gospels reveals that Jesus taught with primarily two themes in mind. He taught about the kingdom of God, and he taught about the will of God. God's kingdom and God's will. Let's look at our text once again. Mark's gospel tells us that Jesus began his ministry with these words. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said that time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Those are the first words. Recorded of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And since Mark's is the earliest gospel, these are the first recorded words of Jesus in the New Testament. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. In Luke chapter 9, verse 11, Luke says that Jesus welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, after the resurrection, Jesus meets with the disciples and teaches them for a period of about 40 days. And the Bible says he taught them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And how many of Jesus' parables in Matthew did Jesus begin with these words? The kingdom of heaven is like. It's like a mustard seed. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. Time and time again, Jesus was teaching the people. It was the substance of his teaching, the kingdom of God. What did he mean by that? What is the kingdom of God? Does it have anything to do with nations and with with boundaries and borders, like the borders of Texas or the borders of, of our nation? No, the kingdom of God has nothing to do with boundaries. It goes way beyond nations. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God over the earth. Let me repeat that. The kingdom of God is God's sovereign rule over the earth. And when Jesus came to our world, he established the kingdom of God, not in nations, but in the hearts and lives of people who chose to follow him. When you place your faith and trust in Christ, you're not joining a club. 
You're not pledging a sorority or a fraternity. You're not offering to serve on a board of directors for some benevolent institution. When you give your life in faith to Jesus Christ, you are becoming an obedient subject in the eternal kingdom of our Heavenly Father. And you are saying to Him from here on out, You are my Master and You're my Lord, and I am here to serve and to follow You. Now, of course, not everyone acknowledges the sovereign rule of God in their lives or on this planet. Not everyone has at this point been brought under the lordship of Christ. And yet with the first coming of Jesus, he established his kingdom in the hearts and lives of people. The sovereign rule of God in our lives. And when Jesus Christ returns, as Handel says of Messiah, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That means that while there is time, you and I need to become a part of his kingdom. In between services, the reason I was a little late coming in this morning, I had the privilege of leading a high school sophomore into the kingdom of God. She gave her heart and faith to Jesus Christ in my office on her knees. Have you ever done that? Have you ever bowed your heart and your soul to the sovereignty of God? Have you ever been born again as a son or daughter of the king? Until we do that, we are not in his kingdom. We are in rebellion to his kingdom. But he calls us to do that, and that's what he taught. The kingdom of God, the sovereign rule of God over the earth. But he also taught the will of God. The will of God. In that verse we read from John chapter 6 earlier, or maybe I forgot to read it. I believe I did. John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus came to do the will of God. He taught us to do the will of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The kingdom of God God's sovereign rule over the earth and the will of God. What is the will of God? The will of God is God's sovereign purpose for the earth. God's sovereign purpose for the earth. And we discover that purpose through the teaching and the ministry of Christ. His sovereign purpose for us, his will for us, is all about how we are to live and how we are to act. How we are to behave as citizens of that kingdom. And we get the clue of what that's about from the Gospels. In John chapter 6, 38, we read that verse a moment ago, that it, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. But verse 40 says, this is the will of my Father. You want to know what God's will is? Jesus says, here it is. Here's the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. That's God's will. That every person behold Jesus, the Son, and in beholding Him, we come to place our faith and trust in Him, just like Alexis did a few minutes ago. We place our faith and our trust in Christ as our Savior and Lord. In John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the will of God. That through His family, the rest of the world comes to see what the love of God is all about by the way that we treat one another. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's God's will. That through believers, we help other people come into His kingdom. Through believers, we help others come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. The kingdom of God, the will of God. The kingdom of God, God's sovereign rule over the earth. The will of God, God's sovereign purpose over the earth. His purpose for your life and for my life. That was the substance of Jesus' teaching. He taught it by what he did. He taught it by what he said. He used different methods, confrontation, imagination, explanation, depending on the group that he was with. But his teaching was so effective. His method and his substance was so effective that we've not been able to get away from the teachings of Jesus for the last 2,000 years. And that brings us to one final question. It's the question we always ask when we're preaching or teaching the Word of God. It's the question, so what? What does all this mean? How does all this apply to me? Well, if you're a teacher, like Jimmy Polk. By the way, 
Thursday, I was visiting our folks in the hospital. We had three folks in the hospital in Dallas, three different hospitals. And after I was done with those visits, I was driving back and hadn't had dinner, so I stopped at my favorite In-N-Out Burger. Uh, have you ever had an In-N-Out Burger? We don't have an Abilene, but they oh, man, they're great. And, and you always need to look at the cup and, and, and the sack of French fries and, and the burger wrapper. They've always got a verse of Scripture on them. It'll be John 3.16. It'll be Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, Nahum 1, verse 7. Uh, there's always a scripture there, so, so, so look for that. But I, I walk into this, uh, it's kind of in the White Settlement area on 820 north of Fort Worth, and I walk into this uh, uh, In-N-Out Burger, and there are about 20 kids in red t-shirts, high school students, and it all says Cougars. And they're the whole tennis team from Cooper Cougars. They just won a match 18 to 1. I don't know who they beat, but they just thrashed somebody. And I said, do any of you guys know Jimmy Pogue? Jimmy Pogue, we know Mr. Pogue. If you're a teacher, how does this apply? Influence. Influence. If you're a teacher of any kind, you have incredible influence in the lives of your students, the lives of your pupils. We go back to that fourth grade classroom at South Elementary in Brownwood, Miss Mary Jane Bowden. We love Miss Mary Jane, but we feared Miss Mary Jane. I remember Hogan came home from school one day. I said, Hogan, how was your first day at school? Well, my teacher's mean, but she's fair. I said, really? He said, yeah. Well, what does that mean, Hogan? Well, she's, she's mean to everybody. So she's, she's mean, but she's fair. <laughs> Miss Mary Jane wasn't mean, but boy, she could be strict. And one day, she asked me and Shay and Steve and Tim and Ricky to stay after class while the rest of the class was going out for recess. And we all looked at each other and we're trying to think, what did we do? Man, we're in trouble now. A few weeks earlier <clears throat> was the day they took the school pictures. You remember that? If you're my age, it was, you know, they had your pictures. It was always in living black and white. And, and uh, uh, you would order a picture packet the day your picture was taken. Mom puts you in your best shirt, and she always hoped that the pictures were taken in the morning so your church would, shirt would still be clean for the picture taken that afternoon. And you ordered a picture packet. And in that packet, you'd have probably three five-by-sevens, one for mom and one for the, uh, both sets of grandparents. And then there would be the little wallet size. And maybe you get eight or you get 16. I don't remember getting more than that. And when those pictures came, it was an exciting time. You cut those wallet size pictures up and you traded them with your friends in the classroom. And you didn't have enough for everybody, but you traded them with as many as you could, the special ones. And maybe, you know, your buddies and maybe that special girl in the class next door, you saved one for her. Well, this was the day before we were getting our pictures back. And Miss Bowden had Steve and Shay and Tim and Rick and myself come up to her desk while the rest of the students left and went out for recess. And she said, tomorrow, when you get your pictures and you cut them up and you start trading them with your friends, you make sure I want all five of you boys to trade a picture. And I'll call him Tommy. That wasn't his name. But you make sure you trade a picture with Tommy. Now, Tommy was that kid in our class who was way too big for his age. He was awkward physically and athletically. He was always the last boy you chose to be on your team, whether it was basketball or baseball, whatever you're playing at recess, always the last boy. He he was awkward socially, and and, uh, his his, his, uh, schoolwork was always messy. But Miss Bowden said, I want you boys to trade pictures with Tommy. Do you understand me? And we all said what we always said to Miss Bowden. Yes, Miss Bowden. And we never talked about that. I, the next year I moved on to California. But we traded pictures the next day with Tommy as we traded with everybody else. And he traded pictures with us. But one of those boys, one of those five, was Steve. Steve was my roommate at Baylor for all four years and best man at my wedding. And at Baylor we talked about it. You remember that day Miss Bowden had it? Oh, yeah, I remember that day. You know, she didn't have that in her lesson plans that morning. I'm convinced of that. Had nothing to do with reading, writing, arithmetic. Had everything to do with boys becoming men, real men. Had everything to do with with becoming compassionate people. And and, and, um, recognizing the underdog. Influence. You've got a ton of it. Realize that. Second, more doing, less speaking, less saying. 
Again, Ms. Bowden didn't say a lot that day. It's just what she did. And that lesson has remained with me all of my life. Someone has said, it's an old adage, uh, communicate God's love to people every day. And if necessary, say something. By what we do, we communicate God's love. We communicate God's truths, just like Jesus did by what he did, as much as what he said. So more doing, less saying. More obedience, less arguing. Do you remember how Jesus taught the religious leaders? He didn't use imagination or explanation. He used confrontation. Because with them, they were always arguing with what Jesus was saying. They were always against him and opposed him. If, as you're reading God's word, if, as you're listening to God's word being preached, if, as you're in Sunday school class and the word of God, the word of Jesus is being taught, if you find yourself confrontationally, Receiving the word. If you find yourself arguing in your spirit with the Bible, if you find yourself always disagreeing with what God is saying, that's a bad place to be. That's a scary place to be. That's exactly where these religious leaders who were fixed against Jesus were. Now, when you hear the words of Jesus, we ought to always be challenged, certainly. And we should always listen and, and let it spark our imagination. But if you're constantly doubting the Bible and arguing with God's word, you really need to examine where you are in your relationship with him. Jesus said, when you trust me, I'll give you my spirit. And my Holy Spirit will guide you into the truth. Are you receiving God's word as the truth? Are you receiving the word of God with a receptive heart and an obedient spirit? Or are you receiving God's word belligerently in a resistant manner? I'll just let the spirit deal with that. And then finally, what's the objective? So what? What's the objective? The objective is letting the teaching of Christ enter your heart, receiving it obediently, and let it make a difference. Let it conform you to the image of Christ. I told you before about Susanna Wesley. In fact, we talked about two of her 15 children the other day. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, John and Charles Wesley. John Wesley, her son, is the one that rode on horseback 250,000 miles, a quarter of a million miles on horseback in his ministry preaching the Word, teaching the Word, establishing Methodist churches. He's the one who preached 80,000 sermons and said at the end of his life, I never grew weary in it and I never grew weary of it. He loved the work. His mother, Susanna Wesley, an incredible teacher. Obviously, she homeschooled her children back in those days. On her child's, all of her children's first birthday, she taught them to cry Quietly, I don't know how she did it. I wish she had left the formula for it. But on her, their first birthday, she taught them to cry quietly. On their fifth birthday, no birthday party, but she taught each of her children on their fifth birthday the alphabet. On the day after their fifth birthday, she had them reading Genesis 1-1. One day, when John and Charles were out preaching, she wrote them a letter. And she said, boys, the object of good preaching is not to fill men's minds with facts about God or with facts about the Bible, but it is to change their lives. Church family, when we come to the word of Christ and we come to the teachings of Jesus, we receive them openly. We receive them in faith. We receive them recognizing that these are the words of truth and we allow them to sink deep into our hearts and change us, conform us into the image of Christ. And as we receive his word in that manner, then we begin to understand why Mark says in the previous chapter, chapter 6, verse 2, that when he stood and spoke in their synagogue, the people were astonished. At what he taught. Luke says when he spoke in the synagogues of Galilee that the people praised God. And we'll understand what Peter meant when Jesus 
Look to the disciples after the crowd was leaving. He, he fed the 5,000 the day before. They came the next day wanting more fish and more bread. And he said, uh-uh, all you get today is me. And they left. And Jesus turns and in some of the saddest words of the gospel, he says to his disciples, so are you guys going to leave me also? And Peter said, Lord, no way. To whom would we go? You alone have the words of life. It's no wonder they called him rabbi. It's no wonder they called him teacher. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for sending us in Jesus exactly what we needed. A Savior, a Shepherd, Messiah, Lord, a King, and a Teacher. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did and for what you said that revealed to us the truths of God. So much we have learned but have not yet applied. By Your grace, by Your Spirit within, help us to do what You have taught us. And where we need to learn more, may we be open and eager to read and to study and immerse ourselves in Your Word. Father, help us to recognize if we are being resistant if we are being argumentative when you speak to us instead of readily obedient, forgive us. Bring us back to the right path. And if there are any this morning who, like Alexis, came to church today not knowing you, may they also leave here today like Alexis, having trusted you as their Lord and Savior. Bless you, Rabbi. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing our hymn of commitment that Danny has chosen for us this morning. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. If God is moving in your heart to make a decision public, like Danny's parents did last Sunday when they came to become a part of our church family, this is the time to respond. Jeff will be here. I'll be here. More importantly, the Lord is waiting. Maybe somebody shared Christ with you this week and you trusted Jesus as your Savior. And you'd come today to say, I want the church to know about this, to rejoice with me. I want to follow Him in baptism. Or maybe you're looking for a church family and you'd come to unite with us. You already know Christ. You just need a church home in Abilene. We'd love to be that home for you. However God might be leading, if it's a special area of ministry and service and you have been wrestling with that but you've said yes and you just need the church to stand with you and and support you and pray for you we'd be glad to do that you come as we sing together jesus paid it all